Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Honor the Lord, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful today to come into your house, come into your presence, lift our hands and our voices, praise you and worship you, God. Thank you for what you've already done in this church service today. God, we don't want to stop there. We want to go further. We want to go deeper with you, Lord. So we pray that as we open up your word today, that you would open it up to us. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear, hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we'll put our interest, our attention, and we'll do our part. God, we know you'll do your part, illuminating the word to our lives, God, applying it to our lives, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that we remember your word and that it gives us the instruction, the correction, the discipline the vision, the wisdom for each and every one of our individual lives. May it produce fruit, God, fruit that remains. Lord, we love you and we praise you, God. How wise and awesome you are that you can speak a now word to every life in this place. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we would ask that you bless them as you bless us this day. May your presence and your spirit be amongst them as you would be amongst us, God. So we would ask that you bless our Baptists and Lutheran, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest, Oak Valley, and Father, for the well and the way. God, so many churches, so many denominations, too many to name. But God, if they're naming our Lord Jesus Christ, they're our brothers and sisters, and we bless them this day as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You can grab a seat and go with me in your Bibles to the wonderful text of Hebrews. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, we go line upon line, precept upon precept in the Word of God. Now, you might be thinking, what does that mean? Well, the Word of God was written in a thought. There wasn't chapter and verse. And so we believe that if God wrote it that way, we ought to be able to understand it that way. And so we've been going through Hebrews, the fifth and sixth chapter. And really, the sixth chapter, we've been in it for quite some time now. And gaining an understanding of what the Spirit of God and what the Word of God has to say to our lives. So here we are in Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Last time we were together, we were in verse number nine, talking about things that accompany salvation. Brilliant message. If you didn't get a hold of that, you can go online, get it for free, or the CDs are available for you today there at the CD counter. But get a hold of that understanding because there's so many things that accompany salvation. Last time we were together, we just got a basic, like, overview, just scratching the surface from Pastor Luke. Brilliant message and uh, just great. Now, we could have continued on that because there's more things that accompany salvation. But I believe that as we read through verse number 10, we'll find something else that accompanies our salvation. See, we could have named the title of today's message, More Things That Accompany Salvation, or, or this other thing that accompanies salvation. But I believe that the Spirit of God is going to continue to show us what's taking place in our life. Verse number 10, Hebrews the sixth chapter says these words. It says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Title of today's message, you see it there highlighted in the words of the scripture, is the labor of love. Title of today's message is the labor of love. Now, our work and our labor of love is something that accompanies our salvation. See, oftentimes, uh, world religions get this wrong. They, they, put, they put it backwards. They put it in the opposite order. They say that you work in order to get your salvation. And yet Jesus came. He paid the price for us, went to the cross so that we didn't have to, took the punishment for our sin upon himself. And now as we believe in Jesus and his sacrifice for our sins, and now we give our hearts and lives to him, we get an exchange, his life for our life, his righteousness for our unrighteousness, his purity for our stained, sinful lives. Now all of a sudden, we are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is in us. And there's no amount of good works that you can do in order to obtain salvation. You do not work to get salvation, but rather because you are saved, you work. Are you listening today? So one of the things that accompanies our salvation is a labor, a labor of love. It is a work that comes forth from our lives. As we give our hearts and lives to Jesus, we start to do good works. And it's easy to think that those good works that we oftentimes do as Christians are forgotten by the Lord. Maybe this has happened to you. Maybe you did everything right. Maybe you started out your life with Christ and you started to do good things for God and you started to see that your life is transformed, your life is changing, and you've done everything right. And yet, even in the midst of doing everything right, everything wrong has started to take place in your life. Even though you poured into your job, you still got a pink slip, even though you worked under the Lord. 
Even though you raised your children in the ways of the Lord and disciplined them the right way according to what God's word has to say. You weren't provoking them to wrath. You weren't overbearing. You weren't harsh. You were loving. You were kind. You disciplined them. And you raised them up in the way they should have gone and they still went south. Maybe in your marriage you did everything right. You loved your spouse as Christ loved the church. Or you laid down. You submitted to your husband. As the church is subject to Christ in all things. And you, you knew those scriptures. You did them in your life. You did them in your marriage. And yet, still, the other person decided to walk away from the marriage. Can we talk today where we live? See, oftentimes we look at our lives and we say, God, I did everything right. And yet everything wrong is happening in our lives. And sometimes, maybe if you're like me, sometimes you look around and say, well, maybe it's something I did. You know, anybody other than Pastor Dan kind of think that way sometimes? You know, it's just, it, it's just natural. It's something that we do. We say, you know what? Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe this bad has come upon me because I messed up. I sinned. I did something bad. And therefore, I'm reaping what I've sown, and I, bad things are coming on me because I did bad. And yet, you know what? The Bible says that God doesn't repay us according to our sin anymore. He repays us according to the blood of Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, your sin is washed away. Your sin is now under the blood. It is forgiven, and it is forgotten. Now, yes, you do reap what you sow. And if you sow into the wrong things, you're going to reap from those things. But we shouldn't think that just because something bad happens in our life, that that's got to be a consequence of sin. God has dealt with our sin. God has dealt with what's on the cross. So if you're sowing the right thing, your sin is covered, then it must not be that. So you've given your heart and life to Jesus. Now your sin is taken care of. But does God forget about your life after your sin is taken care of? Does God ignore our life? Oh, they're, you know what? They're in Christ. That's all I needed from them on the earth. And now God turns his back and goes and looks for other people who are still sinners. He's not really concerned with what's going on in our life anymore. Is that how God is? The answer to that is no. No, God is intimately involved in our lives. God is invested in our lives. God is interested in what is taking place in our everyday lives. And it's easy for us to say, well, you know what? But I did everything good and I got everything bad. So what's taking place? What's going on? And I believe as we look in the Word of God, we'll see that it's more than just good and bad. It's more than just sowing and reaping. This is the plan and the will of God in our lives. Because the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 10, for God is not unjust. God is not unjust. Uh, some of your translations may say, God is not unrighteous. In other words, there is a right way of God. There is a justice of God, a just way of God. And no matter what takes place in our lives, no matter what happens, no matter the trials and the tribulations, the temptations that come against us, the adversity that takes place in our life, doesn't matter any of that stuff that happens. Why? Because God is still just. God is still on the throne. God is still God. God is still righteous. No matter what takes place in my life, am I going to only accept good from the Lord and not adversity? See, that's what we have to live in in our lives. We have to remember that God has not forgotten us. God is not leaving us. God has not turned his back on us. No, God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me, the Bible says. And therefore, we need to understand that just because we're encountering some trouble in our life doesn't mean that God's not there. God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love. God remembers. God sees. God knows. Now, we see this in the Bible in the book of Acts, chapter number 10, if you turn there with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 10. In the book of Acts, we find chapter number 10, great chapter, pivotal chapter in the word of God when the Gentiles are brought into the church. You say, who's the Gentiles? Well, the Gentiles were anybody outside of the covenant. The Jewish people had a covenant with God, and therefore, they were the chosen ones of God, and they had a covenant. And up until this time, Jesus came and he ministered to the lost sheep of Israel first. Now it was time for that expression of the church, the gospel to be preached to the Gentiles, to the people outside of the Jewish nation. So here we find Acts chapter 10, verse number 1. There was a certain man. Everybody say a certain man. Amen. Notice it didn't say a brother, didn't say a disciple, didn't say a person in the church. This was just a certain man. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. So this was a Roman man, an Italian man, and he was the leader, a centurion, a, a military leader in the army. But look at verse number two. It starts to talk about his character. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household. So we find out not only was he devout, but he feared God. And not just him, his entire household feared God. Wow. 
Wow, let's read on. One who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Man, you look at this guy's life and you take a look at him and you say, my goodness, this guy's better than a lot of people I know in church. Can we talk today? I mean, this guy's life was exemplary. You could look at him and say, my goodness, this is how we ought to be. He fears God. He gives alms to the people. He prays to God always. His entire household is in order. They're all fearing the Lord too. He's devout. My goodness. Well, let's find out what happens. Remember, he is a Gentile. He is outside of the covenant of God with the Jews. The gospel has not been preached to him yet, but he still fears God. He still prays. He still gives alms, and he's devout. Verse number three, about the ninth hour of the day. He saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, verse number four, and when he observed him, he was afraid. This is a military leader. But yet he looks at this angel and all of a sudden he's afraid. And look at what he says. He says, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. In other words, this man by himself on his own, even though he feared God, even though he gave alms, even though he prayed to God, he still didn't have Jesus. And without Jesus, he was not headed for heaven. He needed Jesus in his life for his salvation. And so God sees his life. God sees his works. And God is not unjust to let him continue on a path to hell, believing that he's okay with God. No, God sees his life and intervenes and sends an angel to him. Now, the angel gives him instructions. He says, your prayers and your alms have come up a memorial before God. So God saw his life. God remembered his life. And now God intervenes, and the angel tells him, I want you to send for Peter. Peter's down in Joppa, and have Peter come and preach the gospel to you. So he sends for Peter. Now, you may know the story. You may not. Peter's up on the roof in the house in Joppa, and there up on the roof, he has a vision, vision of a large sheep being let down out of heaven. You can read this in Acts 10th chapter on your own time. And as he sees this sheep let down, there's all kinds of animals. Now, the Jews didn't eat all kinds of animals. They only ate what they called clean animals. And so here he sees all these animals, clean and unclean, and the Lord says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, oh, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything that's unclean. And the sheet goes back up. Now, this happens three times. At the third time, the Lord says, do not call unclean what I have made clean. So Peter comes out of this vision, and right at that moment that he's coming out of the vision, kind of pondering this vision, these men come up from Cornelius' houses, obviously Gentiles, saying, hey, we were told in a vision that we needed to come and Speak to Peter so that he can come and declare to us the words of life. So Peter hears about this and he goes with them because he realizes God wasn't talking about food. God was dealing with a prejudice in his heart. And therefore, if he would have not had that prejudice dealt with, he wouldn't have gone with it. Oh, no, I can't go and speak to you guys. You guys, are, uh, you guys are unclean. You guys are Gentiles. But now he understands that the Lord has declared them clean and therefore he goes with them. So he sits down in Cornelius' house. He says, why don't you guys tell me what happened? Tell me about what's going on. So Cornelius starts speaking to him, tells him he saw the angel, saw the vision. His prayers and alms have been coming up a memorial before God. And now he is supposed to listen to what Peter has to say. And so Cornelius and his whole household is all gathered there, ready to listen to what Peter has to say. So Peter starts to say something. Acts chapter 10, verse number 34 and verse number 35. Five. Take a look at it with me. Acts chapter 10, verse number 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth... I perceive that God shows no partiality. Now, that word partiality, you could say that God doesn't play favorites. He sees that God wasn't just concerned with the chosen ones of Israel. No, God is looking after the entire world. In other words, everybody has a level playing field before God. God's not just after men, not just after women, not just after one group, the educated, the pretty, the smart, the nice. Doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter your culture, your education, your your social status, how much money or your financial situation. None of that matters to God. God does not show partiality. God does not take a look on certain people as greater when it comes to salvation. No, God takes a look at everybody with a level playing field. You could say it like this, God is not unjust. Are you listening? Verse number 35, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. See, remember, Cornelius and his household feared the Lord. Therefore, they were accepted by him. They worked righteousness. Righteousness is the right wisdom of God, the right way of God. And so here they are, fearing the Lord, working righteousness. And now Peter says, you guys have been accepted by God. But there's one thing that they still were lacking, remember. And so Peter opens his mouth, 
starts to preach the gospel to them, tells them about Jesus, how he went to the cross, how he died, how he went to the grave, and how he was raised up on the third day while Peter's still speaking. The Holy Spirit descends upon them all, and they must have got saved because they all get baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. They start to prophesy, speak with other tongues, declaring the mighty works of the Lord. And all the Jews with Peter, and Peter, they're all amazed, and they say, look it, they've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. What's stopping them from being baptized with water? Come on, boys and girls, let's go. And they go out, and they baptize the whole household in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what is taking place? Here was a man who, without Jesus, would have been headed for hell, but God is not unjust to forget God saw his works. God heard his prayers. God knew where he was. He knew how to get a hold of him. And he sent Peter to preach the gospel to him. And God intervened in his life. Now, you may be thinking, well, Pastor Dan, that's great. That's wonderful. I, I get it. But here was a good man that did a lot of good deeds, and his good deeds were remembered, and he got good in return. Remember, we opened this by saying a lot of us do good and get bad. And we're wondering, what's up with that? Well, there are some examples in the Word of God. You can find people that did everything right. People that did do good throughout their lifetime and still received bad. How about a man in the Old Testament who was a righteous man, who did good, who prayed for his children? He, he was actually commended by God before the angels and before the devil himself. You know who I'm talking about. His name is Job. Turn me to the Old Testament, the book of Job. Right before the Psalms, you'll find Job, J-O-B, not Job, Job. And you remember, here Satan presents himself with all the angels of God. And the Lord says, what are you doing here? He says, well, I've been walking around the earth to and fro. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Just an upright man in all his ways. Satan said, yeah, but he doesn't fear you for nothing. All you do is give him good. He does good because you give him good. And the Lord says, ah, let's, let's have a little test here. Let's check it out. He says, you can take all he has, but don't touch the man. So in one day... Job, a righteous man, a man who did good, according to what God said, one day everything he has is wiped out. All his family, all his wealth, everything completely gone in one day. Now, the next time Satan presents himself, the Lord says, well, he says, skin for skin, you know, you didn't let me touch the man, but you know what, he'll curse you to your face if you take his health from him. The Lord says, don't kill him, but you can touch his flesh. And so Satan puts painful boils all over Job. Here Job is scraping his boils with a pot shirt. His wife comes out, says, curse God and die. So now he's lost his entire family. The one person who should be with him has turned her back on him. And there he is, no health, no wealth, no family, no nothing. And out of Job's own mouth, let's find out about what kind of life Job lived. Because if you listen to the words of Job, Job is expressing not only that he prayed for his children, not only that he was upright in his heart, but let's take a look at the activities of what Job did. Job chapter 29, starting in verse number 12. Job chapter number 29 and verse number 12, Job is describing his life. And he says these words in Job chapter 29, verse 12, because I delivered the poor who cried out. The fatherless and the one who had no helper. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Verse 14, I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind. I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and I searched out the case that I did not know. Verse 17, I broke the fangs of the wicked and plucked the victim from his teeth. I mean, look at the life that this man lived. It wasn't just about him. It wasn't just about his family. This was people that he didn't even know. He was out there in the city. He was out there at the gate. He was out there taking care of people, eyes to the blind, feet to the lame. I mean, this guy was doing good things. And when the Lord remembers Job, it seems like all hell broke out against Job. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I can identify. The husband walked out. The wife turned her back. Kids went south. Job went away. The well is dried up. No longer good in my life. But if you've read the end of the story, church, you'll find out that Job never got off God. He didn't allow adversity in his life to let him curse God. In fact, God says, Job's the only one out of all of you guys, because Job had some friends come over, they started talking, he said, out of all you guys, Job's the only one who said what was right about me. So Job prays for his friends, and we find out that God gave Job double for his trouble. Double the family, double the wealth, double every, everything in Job's life was double. You can go back and you can calculate, just multiply what he had before. And he was a very wealthy man before. But God doubled all of that back into his life after all of this adversity. 
Then you fast forward to the New Testament book of James chapter 5. James says, you've heard of the perseverance of Job and the end intended by the Lord. In other words, God had a purpose for what Job went through. And God is not unjust. God didn't forget Job's works. God didn't just give him adversity on the earth. No, God had an end in mind. God knew that he wouldn't get off of him. God knew that Job was going to stay faithful. God knew that he could shove that in the devil's face. And at the end of it, God said, I really want to bless Job. I'm really going to pour out all of this on Job. He's going to get double for his trouble. And therefore, that's what I want to do. Maybe you didn't know, but God has a future in mind for you. God has a blessing in store for you. But the road to it may go through some valleys, may go through some dark places, but that's the end intended by the Lord. God says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans of good to give you a future and a hope, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. See, God has an end intended. But just because we go through adversity does not mean that God is unjust or unkind. No, God is gracious, loving, and kind. He knows what we can handle. And so as we go through those trials, we need to remember that God is not unjust to forget. God remembers. God knows. God sees. Just stay faithful and stay on Jesus because God is a lover and God is a giver. Amen. God is a lover and God is a giver. Maybe, maybe you know this verse, John chapter 3, verse 16. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he did what? Gave. He gave. Gave. See, God loves, so God gives. How about this one? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, God's love and God's giving go hand in hand. And if we're to be like God, if we believe God, if we have faith in God, then our faith will be worked out in acts of love. Let me say that again. If we believe God, then our faith will be worked out in acts of love. Remember, we already said that these are things that accompany salvation, that works don't save you, but after you get saved, you do works. Why? Because you love God, and because God loves and he's a giver. Therefore, if we love God, then we start to look like him, and our love translates into our giving. See, church, we've been fed a lie. You know what the lie is? Oh, just get saved? Grace of God will do everything for you. You don't have to do anything ever again. You can just live however you want to live, do whatever you want to do, and it's okay because the grace of God will take care of it. That's a lie. See, the truth is that, yes, grace is there, grace is present, grace is active, grace is working in our lives, grace is covering sin, grace is empowering us for ministry, grace is giving us so many things. And yet, the Apostle Paul said, it wasn't just me, it was the grace of God in me, yet I worked, I did all, and the grace of God worked, and the grace of God did all. And therefore, church, we have so rejected works because we've said we don't get saved by works. That's right, you don't. But when you get saved, you do works. Why? Because we're being like our Father, who's a lover and a giver. Therefore, we're going to be lovers and givers. We're going to go out there and do good works. We're going to go out there and love somebody. We're going to go out there and tell somebody about Jesus. Empowered by grace. Let's take a look at it in the Word together. 1 John chapter 3. Show this to you. 1 John chapter number 3. time for the church to rise up and get active, to wake up, to identify the lies that have held us back from doing what God has called us to do and be everything that God has called us to be. First John chapter 3, verse number 17 and verse number 18. First John chapter 3, verse 17 starts out and says this. It says, but whoever, everybody say whoever. whoever. You know that's you and me. I'm a whoever. You're a whoever. Why? Because everybody's somebody. So whoever has this world's goods. Now, we all have this world's goods. doesn't matter how much or how little of it you have, you have it. And above and beyond that, you have faith and you have the Spirit of God and the grace of God. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now, the question that he's asking is, if you see your brother in need and you say, "Mm -mm, no, I don't care. I could supply that need, but you know what? Uh uh-uh. uh. He says, if that's your attitude, then how, do the, how does the love of God abide in you? What does abide mean? Live, stay, and do all. See, when you receive Jesus in your life, 
Jesus comes and lives on the inside of you. Now you have the love of God on the inside of you. Why? Because God is love. And so love should be flowing not only in us, but also through us to the people around us and to changes the world that we live in. Why? Because love is the supreme power of the universe. If God is love, God is the supreme power, then love is the supreme power of the universe. And so if we see needs around us, we see our brethren in need, and we have this world's good, and we can supply for that need, but we shut up our heart and we say, oh, no, I, I need this. I got to use this. I, I, maybe something's going to happen down the road, you know. Uh, there have been some economic hard times, and, and I can't give, I can't help. Or maybe you've gone through something, you know you could offer some assistance, you could offer some advice, you could pray with them, you could encourage them, but yet, oh, you know what, I, I, I just, how does the love of God abide in you? Why? Because we are compelled by the love of God. The love of God constrains us, the Apostle Paul said. It, 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 it's active on the inside of us. It burns within us. It motivates us and moves us. Let's read on verse number 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. A lot of worldly organizations out there saying, oh, we're loving, we're great, we're wonderful. Look how much stuff we've done. Right? We've dug wells. We've put shoes on kids' feet. We've done all this stuff. They talk about how great they are. But when you look at the percentages of how much they make and how much they actually do, that's a front. You start to say, well, wait a second. You could do a lot more. You, you could go so much further. You could have a real impact because you have the resources. Yet God says, I haven't called the worldly organizations to change the world. They have a limited power. They've got a limited understanding. They have a limited capacity. But church, you shouldn't just be saying we're a loving church and not do anything. You know what he just said? He just said talk is cheap. So let's get busy. Let us not love in word or in tongue. Let's not just say we're the church. Let's actually be the church in deed and in truth. Let's get out there and make it happen. Amy Carmichael, a famous missionary, said these words. She said you can give without loving. See, that's what the world does. They give. Why? Because they want to look good. They want you to buy their products. So we, we do all these good works. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Church, how does this work? How does this work? If we're going to be everything that God has called us to be and do everything that God has called us to do, how, how does this happen? How does this happen in our lives? Glad you asked the question. Galatians chapter number five. Galatians chapter number five. Turn there with me. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to take a look at verse number 6. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 6 says these words. It says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Now, what did he just say? He's talking about circumcision. To us, we may say, that's kind of random. What's he talking about? Circumcision. Well, you know the Jews who had the covenant with God they had a covenant of circumcision, cutting away of the flesh, right? The Gentiles did not have that covenant. So here the Apostle Paul's writing the Galatian church, and he says, you know what? There are people who have come in who have said to you that it's okay if you have Jesus, but you still need to have the law. You still need to have this circumcision in order for you to really be saved. Jesus is cool, but this is the really the way. And that was a lie and a falsehood. And he says, listen, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised, not circumcised. That doesn't do you any good. That's a natural thing, not going to help you out in any way. But look at what he says. What really does something, what really happens, what really makes it move is faith working through love. And we got the old KJV, KJV version. Some of you guys, old school, bring in the KJV. Not in this service. Okay, first service and yesterday. All right, good. The old KJV says, but faith worketh by love. In other words, your faith works when you operate in love. So if you picture a tree in your mind, okay, think about a tree. You've got roots, you've got a trunk, you've got the, the limbs and all that, and then fruit coming off of that tree, right? Faith is the root, okay? That's where we're grounded in, grounded in faith. It's grounded in the Word of God. We, we see in the Word of God, we believe, and therefore we are in faith. We believe the Word of God. Now, he said, don't just leave it at that. Faith without works is dead. So we want to get to works, Right? We want to get to that fruit. Jesus wants fruit in our life and fruit that remains. So we want to get to the fruit. So how does that happen? Well, faith worketh by love. Faith works 
by love. In other words, faith is going to translate into works. How? By love. So love is the trunk of the tree. Love is the strength of that tree. Love is what holds up that tree. Love is what matures and grows and develops and gives the life-giving sap to the branches that now can produce fruit in our lives. Are you listening? So faith works by love. Faith empowers the works. How? By love. When we operate in love, the supreme power of the universe, when we believe God and now we operate in love, then the works will be produced and fruit will come out. Fruit that remains. So let's take a look at this. What, what's, what's the formula, if you will? What are, what are we saying here? What are we, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to, number one, believe. You've got to believe the word of God. You've got to love enough, love God enough and love people enough to go out there and do. Three little words, believe, love, and do. Everybody say that with me. Believe, love, and do. Again, believe, love, and do. One more time. Believe, love, and do. See, love will empower. Love will strengthen. Love will support. You know, in Hebrews, the fifth and sixth chapter, is talking about maturity. And if we're going to get mature, church, we've got to operate in love. Let's take a look at it in Colossians chapter 3. You can either turn there or I'll put it up on the overhead for you. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 14. Look at this. But above all, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. What things is he talking about? Well, he just got done in the book. If you read the book, he talked about loving your husband and your wife, loving your children, being a good employee on the job. He just covered a gamut of things, lots of lists, lots of things to go on. He says, but listen, above all these things, above all the do's and don'ts, above all that stuff, put on love. Why? Because it is the bond. It is the strength. It's the thing that stabilizes and holds together perfection. What is that? Maturity, completeness, growing up in the things of God. Put on that love. Remember, Jesus came, and Jesus could have given us a laundry list of things to do. He could have said, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. And there are a lot of things that we can see, principles that we can incorporate into our life. But when they approached Jesus and they said, hey, tell us what's the greatest commandment. There's one thing out of the, all of the law that you would tell us to do. What would it be? He said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. For all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, if we can get just the love of God and the love of people in our lives, all of those other things will flow from that love. You won't murder. You won't steal. You won't commit adultery. You will be... See, all those things, you won't have any other gods before God. All of that flows. Why? Because you love God and you love people. So put it on. Put on love because it's the bond of perfection. Believe, love, and do. Okay? Great example. Great stuff, but how, how does it translate into my life? How does it translate into our everyday life? See, it'd be one thing to know this, another thing to know how, know what, know why, know when. Okay, so let's take some uh, natural examples. Maybe you're a single mom in this place. You work all day, kids are in child care, and, and you come home at night, now you got to make dinner. Kids are going crazy. You put on the television show, and they're slapping each other, throwing things around the room. They have my toy mom, you know, and things are going on, and you're just about ready to go crazy and just beat the children because you don't know what else to do. <laughs> now, rather than operate in the flesh, you got to start with belief. So what does the Word of God say? Well, the Word of God says that I'm supposed to love my children, not supposed to exhaust them, not supposed to exasperate them, not supposed to provoke them to wrath. So I'm not just going to scream and scream and scream and scream and scream until they scream and scream and scream and scream and scream and scream. No, I'm going to love them enough to take some time to believe the Word of God, to love my children, and to lovingly spend time with them, lovingly express to them that mommy needs to make dinner right now. Okay, stop acting crazy. Otherwise, I'm going to lovingly discipline you the way that God says to in the Word of God. Right? See, that's how this translates. You believe, you love, and then you do. See, sometimes we got to love enough to discipline. Otherwise, they're going to be grown-ups that are undisciplined. you got to put them in that now. Now's the time to discipline your children because when they grow up and they're undisciplined, you're not going to be able to do anything. That's why you got to tell your children when they're in the store, don't go running around acting crazy. Stay with mommy. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have any fun. Have fun with your kids. Love your kids. Enjoy life with them. But still, love them enough to do. Love them enough to be a parent. Love them enough to spend time. Okay, what about the worker? 
right? Maybe you're a carpenter and you're out there on the job and as you're going through, the foreman says, hey, you know what? We're taking too much time. We need to hurry this up. We've got to get out of here. There's people coming. Other subs are coming behind us. They need to run the electrical. They need to run the drywall. They need to paint. They need to do all this stuff. And so we need you to hurry up. And as you're going through, you find out that the wood is substand and the wood starts splitting on you. You can't really frame anything. And as you're going through, you tell the foreman, you say, hey, all this wood's split up. He says, you know what? It's going to be covered in drywall. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Now listen, you have a choice at that point. Do you believe what the word of God says that you are to work unto the Lord? And so you've got to believe the word of God. You've got to love God enough to do. Take some time. Pull out the bad stuff. Put in the new stuff. Maybe you've got to spend some extra time there at work. Maybe you've got to call home and say, hey, listen, there's some stuff going on here, and I I cannot do substandard work for these people that are going to live in this house. I need to pour into this. I need to take some extra time, and I'm going to believe God's going to give me back that time with my family. And so you put in a couple extra hours to make sure that it's done right. See, believe, love, and do. How how about sharing Jesus with your neighbors and the people around you? you got to believe the word of God that Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to all creation, making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Right? So you believe the word of God, and then what do we do? I'm supposed to go. I want to go. I can't share Jesus with them. I'm a little scared. Right? And yet God says, I want you to love people enough. Why? Because they're headed for hell. Each and every person that doesn't know Jesus is on a course to hell. And so we have to love people enough to not let them go and to say and to tell them and to get outside of our comfort zone and to express that love of God to them so that we can go out there and do the job of witnessing and telling people about Jesus, bringing them to church, bringing them into the family. Man, my goodness, this is what this is all about. Jesus said that they will know you by your love. Therefore, if people are going to see Jesus in us, we've got to love people to life. That's how this works. Last verse for today from the message. I'll just put it up on the overhead for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 24. I love how it's paraphrased here in the message. And it says this. Show them what you're made of. If ever there was a gauntlet thrown down, it is right now. Show them what you're made of. The love I've been talking up in the churches. Let them see it for themselves. Church, when you walk out of this place today, Show them what you're made of. Show them the love of God. Go love people to life. Love your husband. Love your wife. Love your children. Love your neighbors. Love your coworkers. Love your boss. Love your in-laws. Love your relatives. Love the unlovable. Love the, the unlikable. My goodness, share the love of Jesus everywhere you go. If God's not unjust to forget our labor, let us not be unjust to forget our duty to him. Amen. Did you guys get something from the word of God today? <laughs> Hallelujah. And so I'm going to ask everybody, I've been nice, but I'm going to ask everybody to please remain seated because God wants to do a work. You know, we wonder why bad things happen in our lives. Sometimes it's no fault of your own, but sometimes you're so in the wrong thing. And so I'm going to ask everybody within the sound of my voice, if you're out there in the foyer, if you're out there in the breezeways, if you're in the bathrooms, finish your business and come and sit in the foyer and listen up. Because God wants to speak to your life right where you're at right now. And this is a serious thing. This is not something to mess around with. Because heaven and hell are real. Life is short. Times are tough. It's time to stop messing around. And I love you enough today to not patty cake and play nice. I am a nice guy. I am very nice and probably too nice at times. And so let me get in your face for a second. Give me the opportunity to tell you something as a man of God and as a representative of God right now. There's a passion of God for your life. God does not want you to go to hell. And yet God loves us so much that he gives us the free will choice while we're here on the earth to choose whether we go to heaven or hell. Now don't give me that foolishness, hell's not real, I don't believe anybody. No, that's foolishness. You can't just bury your head in the sand and act like something's not real, it's going to go away. I could stand on the slow lane of the freeway and say, I don't believe in Mack trucks. I'm going to meet one face to face sooner or later if I stand there long enough. Hell is a very real place. Jesus talked about it. It's talked about in the Old and New Testament. So come on, let's talk. Let's make sure you don't go there. Sometimes people say, well, all roads lead to heaven. You just stick to your truth. I'll stay true to myself, and we'll all get there somehow. God sees that. Yeah, God sees that. But do you think God's a fool? He just says, oh, whatever you want to do, just live however you want to live. Listen, if that was God's way to heaven, then why did Jesus go to the cross? Why did Jesus die beaten, bloody, 
and mess. See, God doesn't just say, oh, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do. Oh, this church wants to do it this way. You guys want to do it that way. Oh, just everybody will come. No. There's one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. I'm not going to get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Come on, church. Let's wisen up. Let's listen up. Let me love you enough to tell you the truth today. You're not going to make it. Some of you might think, well, I've been a good person, done a lot of good deeds in my life. I used to be bad, clean up my act, now I'm good. And God's going to let me into heaven because I've, I've been a good person. Listen, it doesn't matter if your good outweighs your bad. Uh, we've already seen that your salvation doesn't come because you're good. You can't do enough good. In fact, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not going to get there by your goodness. Not going to get there by your church attendance. doesn't matter if you've been raised in church, parents told you you're a Christian. It doesn't matter if you went to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism class. It doesn't matter if you wore religious jewelry like a cross or St. Christopher. Or maybe your parents had you baptized as a Christian as a child. None of that matters because you can't be good enough. You can't attend church enough. Not enough to just sit in church service and call yourself a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian because you sit in church and call yourself a Christian. It's like saying I could sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. Not going to happen. Doesn't work. Come on, let's wise up today. Let's get a hold of the wisdom of God for our lives. How do we get to heaven God's way? Sometimes people think, well, I've been involved in church, and, you know, I've helped out. I've carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in the church. People thought of me as a leader, even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where your church involvement gets you into heaven. You know what that is? Once again, that's good works. You don't do that to get yourself saved. You do that because you're saved. Here's what it comes down to. You must be born again. That's what Jesus said. Now, I know the world would like to water that down. They've raked it to the coals. They've made it out to be something that it's not. But let's not define being born again by what the world says. What does the Bible say about being born again? Well, it's always meant the same thing. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant that you've given God all of your heart, and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. It's that simple. Can't do enough. Can't be good enough. You've got to give it to him, surrendering all of your heart and life to Jesus Christ. It's that simple. In the book of Revelation, Jesus said, when I come, I want to find you hot or cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. There are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying? Lukewarm. Well, that's a little in, little out, little up, little down. A little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance, and God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, that's not going to make it because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected by the body, from the body of Jesus Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I'll be embarrassed if I do that. Time out. Don't embarrass me. Listen, it's not about you being embarrassed. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But think of the trade-off. A moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell away from God forever and ever and ever. No one would make that trade. And yet Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right or push past the embarrassment. Give God all of your heart and all of your life. Probably won't even be embarrassed. We're all rooting for you. We all love you. We want you to do this. We've all done this at one point or another in one way or another. Today is your turn. Will you give God all your heart and all of your life? Who should raise their hand? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. Who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you've just never done this? never said yes to Jesus. Come on. Today is your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at watching by television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online all over the world, get ready to get your hand up. God sees right where you're at. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up for me. Hi. Thank you. There's one, two. Thank you. Who else today? Need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Raise it up high for me. Two. Where are you at? Over here. Anybody? Where are you at? Wave it at me if I don't see you already. I don't see any hand. Thank you. Got you right there. Listen. All right. Three, four. Thank you. Five. Got you up top. Who else today? 
Five wise people already. See, most of the people already left. That's why I got so angry, because there should be probably 20 to 30 people raising their hand right now. We've got five, because people didn't respect the move of the Spirit in here enough to stay put. That's why this is so important, guys. Where else today? Thank you, six. Who else today? Just let me love you enough to tell you the truth. Back in the family, I'm seven. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Where you at, number eight? Where you at, number eight? Who else today? Need to give God all of your heart? Need to give God all of your life? Anybody else real quick? Come on, just pop it up. Wave it at me if I don't see you already. Anybody else? I'm going to close this up. Uh, up top, got you up there. Thank you. Nine, thank you. Where else? Ten over there. Thank you. All right, praise the Lord. Who else today? Ten wise people already. You're saying, yeah, I need to do this. Up there, got you up top. Thank you. Eleven. About 11 wise people. Anybody else real quick? Number 12, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Come on, go for it. Anybody else? Anybody else? See, let me express something to you guys. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Love you enough to get in your face. If I was unloving, I would shut up my heart and let you go to hell. That's not what we do in this place. Every time we get together, we do an altar call. And I want to thank you guys for sitting through that week after week after week. I know it can get boring. It could get mundane. But look at 11 souls that would have gone to hell. Now we can rejoice with them. Why? Because we love them enough to endure. We love them enough to sit through the altar call. Love them enough to invite them to church. All right? Now, all 11 of you, or if you're number 12, 13, 14, 15, all the way up to 20. If you're out there in the foyer, time to come in. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're going to clap, give a shout, and sing a song. As we do that, I want you to get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. No one leaves. You come right now. Come on. Come on in. Come on down. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on, for the family room. Bring your children. Bring your family. This is good. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. They're coming. It's my joy to you. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. They're still coming. Come on, come on, come on. All right. Hey, put a smile on your face. You know what? You guys are tough. Let me get in your face like that. You still came. That's good. You know what? You've came to give God all your heart, came to give God all of your life. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Put a smile on your face, all right? I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church and wonder, are they weird? Listen, you've already got past me. This is about as weird as you're going to encounter today. He's cool. He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance, okay? First thing he's going to do is lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, give you some free stuff, some free literature. You can sit down and read about what to do next in your walk with God. It's easy reading. It's free. Okay? Go ahead and get a hold of that and find out what to do next in your walk with God. Final thing he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church called the spiritual personal trainer. Now, you heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong? Spiritual personal trainer is a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. It's easy. It's free. You need to do it. Now, listen, I'm going to make a promise to you guys. Here's the promise. Give God one year of your life here at this church, sitting under the word of God and the teaching here at The Rock. At the end of that year, for the rest of your life, you will just be so blessed that you'll say, I didn't know it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. You guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.